okay? Let's get into our, our message today. We're talking about I promise and how important it is. It seems like promises these days, people make promises and they break them all the time. Can you even trust a promise anymore? And I, I, I'm going to say this to you, that without promises, relationships are extremely fragile, weak, and life without promises is horrible. If you can't make a promise, if you can't keep your word, life becomes cheap. Life becomes unstable. And there's no safe place anymore when they're without promises. And this goes all the way from a financial transaction. That's why we have so many lawyers, right? I mean, it used to mean you, you shook someone's hand. It was a gentleman's handshake or or a gentlewoman's handshake, and it meant something. But now today, I'll say whatever I want to say, we throw words around cheaply. And as a result of that, there's a lack of trust. With, with, with a lack of trust, there's a lack of security. With that lack of security, there's insecurity and fear and anxiety. And is there any wonder why there's so much turmoil in our culture today? Is there any, I mean, think about it. In 1969, the beloved Ronald Reagan who became our president later, was a governor of California. And in 1969, he did something that was detrimental. I'm not happy with what Ronald Reagan did in 1969. He signed a bill called No Fault Divorce. In other words, it doesn't make a difference if there's a promise. If it's no one's fault, let's just do it. He cheapened marriage by that bill. Now, if I've offended you about Ronald Reagan, I'm sorry. But he was not the Messiah. Surely he was not. He caused a lot of problem in the social fabric of our country by signing that law. That was the beginning of the crack, starting in California, and it went throughout the United States. Now, it sounds like freedom, but it's not. When you have marriages that no longer... Listen, let me just stop you for a second. I am not here to beat anyone else up that went through a divorce. We understand things happen. We live in an imperfect world. We make mistakes. God's a God of new beginnings. God is a God who will forgive whatever you've done. So this is not, please don't hear what I say. Say he's coming after me. I'm not coming after you at all. God loves us. He loves us and he knows that if we can't keep commitments, then life becomes chaotic. And when life becomes chaotic, there's anxiety, there's war, there's all sorts of health issues. I mean, it costs our country trillions of dollars if you think about the problem of no-fault divorce. So, I, I'm sorry that I just smashed your icon of Ronald Reagan. But I don't worship Ronald Reagan or the Republican Party, I, or the Democratic Party for that matter, it's Jesus Christ. And we have to be very, very careful. What has happened is no-fault divorce. What began to happen is if you don't like what's going on, just escape. And what happened is homes began to break apart at an alarming rate. It was so easy to get a divorce. So the kids never have any security. And so they're growing up with an anxiety going on. And this anxiety goes into psychologists and psychiatrists. And now you have all this difficulty. Please understand. I'm going to say it again. We understand divorce happens. And I understand sometimes it's not your fault. And we're not suggesting for a moment that it's okay and that you're a bad person. But what I'm trying to say is we're saying this not because we want to condemn anyone but because it hurts it hurts it breaks the fundamental promise of love and a relationship and a family if you can't stand on that then everything else means nothing that's why a handshake means nothing anymore I promise means nothing anymore and what has happened as a result of this this law that kind of it basically trickled down you heard of trickle down economics which uh, Ronald Reagan was a big fan of I call it trickle-down moral depravity. And so what began to happen is it became, now your word meant nothing. Now I can say, yeah, I'll do that. I promise I'll do it. And we don't do what we say. You can't trust people anymore. You can't trust pastors. You can't trust anyone. And it gets to the point where someone says, I'm your friend. And pastor, I love you so much. When I die, please bury me in the parking lot. <laughs> I've heard that before. And then they wanted to bury me in the parking lot. So, you know, and, I mean, think about this. Wouldn't it be wonderful where well, you had friends and say, you know what? I'm committed to you as a friend. I'm committed to you and your children. I'm going to watch after you. And when things get bad, you don't give up on your friends. Imagine that. 
That's powerful, everybody. Give security. Now we have all this fake, I call it chewing gum relationships, which is social media. It tastes like food. It keeps your mouth going. Your saliva glands are going off. It tastes good, but it gives you no nutrition. These type of relationships without real ones are bad. Without commitment, life becomes meaningless. And so what we're going to do in this series is we're going to talk about relationships. And the reason why we're doing this for is because Hallmark and everyone else is telling you to buy chocolates for your wife and flowers, everybody. Men. And Valentine's Day is coming. I gave you an alarm. All right, which reminds me of a couple. There was a pastor that was getting a little along in, in age and he lost all of his teeth. And so he got all of his teeth pulled and he went to the dentist to get a, set a new pair of dentures. And the dentures came back and he had to preach his first Sunday. It was very difficult for him to preach. So the first Sunday he preached, it was only 10 minutes long. Another week went by, the second week he preached, it was only 20 minutes long. You're saying, well, Pastor, why can't you do the same? So he preached for 20 minutes, and then the third week, everyone's like, we're liking this new pastor. He went an hour and 25 minutes, and someone asked the pastor afterwards, Pastor, why did you go so long today? And he said, well, the reason was, is I grabbed my wife's dentures by accident, and I haven't been able to shut up since. Oh, lo loosen, I, you know, can, can, I, can we loosen up a little bit too? My Lord, we get offended by everything. Good night. I, I mean, I have, a, I have a promise for you. I, I guarantee you I will offend you one of these days. So just go ahead and, and, and make a plan to forgive me and I'll forgive you, all right? So we're talking about I promise. And, and 30 to 50% of marriages within the church are failing. And it, whatever, however way you look at statistics, all right, this is what we see happening. Turn my... Watch is going crazy here. Hang on a second. I thought we are going to have a free problem Sunday with electronics. Okay, here we go. Now I'll be left alone. Uh, but anyhow, but we, we find that 50%, 30 to 50% of relationships are failing. How would you like to buy a car and say, oh, we're going to sell you a car, but it has a 30 to 50% chance it will break up and blow up. Would you want to buy that car? Absolutely not. Is it any wonder why people are afraid to get married? But the funny thing is, it's not that funny, then you're cohabitating, and any moment you don't like what's going on, you're out the door. So talk about less stability, right? And so you wouldn't dream of buying a house that has a 30 to 50% chance of falling on you. And so why is this happening in relationships? And I, I wanted to make two ground rules here today, okay? This is the two ground rules. When we talk about and by the way, this is not just for married people, because how many folks know married people? Okay, then you need to help those folks. And by the way, all relationships have the same fundamental rules of engagement. And so relationships are important. And so I want to mention a couple things to you. Number one, if you listen today, do not listen for your spouse. Listen for yourself. I don't want to any elbows hitting anyone's ribs this morning. Is that clear? If you want any ribs, go out to a restaurant. Do not give anyone a rib today, okay? Well, that's first thing. Second thing is Jesus makes all things new. The apostle Paul was a murderer. The apostle Paul was a persecutor. He became the greatest ever, one of the greatest apostles in the history of the church. There was a woman by the name of Rahab who was a prostitute and became the line of Christ. So, if you begin to feel condemned, slap yourself. Okay. I thought that was funny. But anyhow, let's talk about it today. Also, I want to mention something to you as well. It's grace and truth. We want grace and truth. This is what, this is what grace is. Jesus caught the woman in adultery. What do you say? He says, woman, I don't accuse you. Truth is, go and sin no more. So there's grace and there's truth. And please understand me, the reason why God has these things is not to limit our freedom, but to give us greater freedom. What parent does not want to see their child experience greater freedom? And when your child chooses to do things that will hurt itself, of course you're passionate about it, but what the church has done, you know what the church has done. The church acts like siblings. You know what happens with your kids, right? When the kids know the rules, they try to catch the other kids and travel to tell mom and dad. Mom, look what he did. 
And guess what the church does? God, look what they did. Look, 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 they're bad. Can we stop that, please? And realize it hurts us, it hurts each other. And so I wanna just encourage you with that today. And I wanna ask you right now, if you wanna turn it at uh, Song of Solomon, uh, verse eight, six through seven, says the following. It says, place, place me like a seal over your heart. This is about a relationship, great book of the Bible. We did a series on this a couple years ago. We might do it next year. It was a lot of fun. But place like me a seal over your heart. Seal, what does that seal mean? It means protected. Like a seal on your arm, for love is as strong as death. In other words, till death do his part. This is where they got that, that statement from. Do you promise? I promise. Till death do you apart. Till death do me apart. Does us apart. That's where it comes from. A seal around my heart. It's locked. Until death do us part. What does that do when you have that kind of commitment? If you're having a bad day, he's not running out. She's not running out. And when you tell your kids, mom and dad love each other, the kids feel secure. I had our kids come home and, and tell us. And Matthew said, you would never leave mom and dad. What would you happen to my kids, my friends in school? Kids are crying in school. I said, no, I'll never kill your mother. I mean, I'll never, <laughs> I'll never divorce your mother. She might kill me, but I will not. But place you like a seal over your heart, like a seal on your arm, for love is as strong as death, is jealously unyielding as the grave. I mean, I am committed to you. Whatever happens, it doesn't make a difference. I will never give up on you. And honey, I will say that today. I will never give up unto you. And I made a commitment to my wife. She becomes an ax murderer, I still won't divorce her. I will not. It's my commitment, why? Because I wanna make that commitment. Does the law tell me I can divorce my wife? Yes, or under adultery or something like that? Yes, but guess what? Mm -mm. I made a decision. Till death to us does us part. Why? Because it brings security to me, her, brings security to you. We are not going to call it quits on our marriage. Never. And I made a, I made a commitment. And I'm going to keep that commitment with God as my help. And if you, again, if you struggle with that, please understand. We understand stuff happens. So, it's jealousy unyielding as the grave. It burns like a blazing fire, like a mighty flame. This is a very cold earth. We need some flaming, hot, strong relationships that people want to gather around and get warm. My friends, that's what we can do by being the light of the world. You and I have such strong relationships. People are longing for strong relationships. Don't give up. Don't give up. My parents almost called to quits. Back in 19, whatever it was, 1977 or so, they almost caused, called the quits. And now they're married 60 years. They said, no. My mother said, I lost that loving feeling. I have nothing for your father at all. But because of the, one of her friends told her something, poked her and said, hey, this is against the word of God. You have no, you have no right to do this based upon, you have no legal right to do this. And my mother knew in her back of her mind, the Holy Spirit says, you know it's true. So they made a decision. Their decision came before their feelings. And the love was still there, by the way. But it was buried with hurt, discouragement, neglect. And my father, like a lot of men, was absolutely clueless. He thought everything was fine. <laughs> I don't know what it is. So men, that's why we need help. All right? So uh, it's very important. So I wanted to just to... Uh, uh, talk to you about what promise is. Promise is, and it comes from the Latin. I'm not very good at Latin, so forgive me if I'm going to try to pronounce this, but the word promise is from the Latin is uh, promittera, if I said it correctly. If you put that up on the screen, that'd be great. Okay? And so what that means, go to the next slide, please. It actually means pro, forward, mitra, send. So pro, send. So commitment, simply promise, means forward, send. In other words, you send your promise ahead. In other words, you pay for it before it happens. You have to send your promises ahead and not wait for circumstances to change them. I make a commitment to you. I forward send it to you. 
my feelings are going to change, but my commitment will not change. This is what we need in our culture today. We have people today, I don't like church today, I'm going to another one. I'm gonna, listen, I understand there are times to change churches, but everything, think about, I just wanna stop you for a second and hit pause. Since Ronald Reagan's wonderful law in 1969, they signed in the bill, I'm sorry if I'm destroying you, but Ron, I'm doing it for a reason, everybody, because we, we have to stop worshiping political figures and worship the king of kings. Ever since then, have you noticed how companies fire people? Gone! I mean, used to get 50 years at the same company and a gold watch and all that. Now, people will let you go in a second. Pink slips are being handed out like candy. Why? If you can't have commitment in the home, you're not going to have commitment in business world. It, the, the ramifications of no commitment without promises has caused us great duress. How many of you are wondering, is the pink slip coming? It used to be like, you know what? I'm committed to these employees. I'm committed to these empl empl and employees. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stand with you. I'm going to keep you on the books even though we can't afford it because we're, we're a unit together. We're going to work this out. I'll take a pay cut uh, to the boss. We'll work this out together. But now, nope, goodbye. Sad. What does that cause? Anxiety. Worry. Is it any wonder that the mental health of our country is so poor? If you can't trust anything, how are you supposed to move forward? My feelings are going to change, but my promise will not change. See, we need to make a declaration here, and it's this, a promise. A promise is this, a declaration I make now that will be needed for the future. A declaration I make now that will be needed for the future. And guess what, everybody? I have news for you. You're going to need it in the future. There are going to be days where you're going to look at your spouse and go, really? <laughs> okay. There's going to be times. And you have to go, you made a commitment. Stop it. Stop it. You made a commitment. I like what me, uh, Christianity, mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis, one of my favorite authors of all times. This is what he says. I'm going to read to you. Also on the screen. The promise made when I am in love because I am in love to be true to the beloved as long as I live commits me to being true even if I cease to be in love. Even if I cease to be in love. That's what I'm going to do. He goes on to say, the second slide there, a promise must be about things I can do, about actions. No one can promise to go on feeling in a certain way. Listen, we have to make a commitment. It's all of, I'm not happy. If I hear that one more time, if I hear that one more time, I'm not happy. I love our country, and the pursuit of happiness is, is fine, but don't make that the pursuit of everything. Pursuit of holiness, pursuit of God is number one. Happiness is based upon happenstance. A real man and a real woman stick it through even when the emotions say stop. You wanna have a lousy life? Listen to your emotions. It makes nice Hallmark commercials. It makes sappy Hollywood movies, but it makes a lousy life and a lousy leg legacy. You see, this is a promise we need to make. I promise to be faithful even when I lose those love feelings. You've lost that love and feeling. Oh, that love and feeling. Take your iPhone and smash it. I don't care if I lost that loving feeling. I'm a man who does not, it's not up and down. I'm a man that makes a decision. I'm a woman that will put her big girl pants on and stop being run by my emotions. Listen, folks, I'm not going to play around here. This is for your own good and my own good because everything in our culture says, you don't like it, jump out of the plane. you got a parachute. You're fine. You see, there's something that they used to have back in those days called covenant. Cutting a covenant means cutting blood. And it was serious. Now, I'm not suggesting we, we do have razor blades today. So we're going to, no, we're not going to do that. We're not going to cut ourselves and shake hands. But they made blood covenants back in those days, and Jesus made a blood covenant with us. You know what he says? And the, and the last night he was betrayed, he did that. We're going to do it today, by the way. He said this. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood, which I'm poured for you. In other words, I'm making you a promise. 
that if you will give your life to me, I'll forgive you of all your sins. I'm making you a promise. And because I have that promise, I'm secure. Without that promise, you're not secure, and I'm not secure. You see, tomorrow, I'm not going to feel like it. Doesn't make a difference. You see, all relationships primarily need five things. I like, uh, I'm using Jimmy Evans' book called Marriage on the Rock. Great book. Uh, I'm getting these four points. I've had another point, but a great book. I encourage you to read it. I read it this past week, and it was very, very good. He's an excellent, him and his wife are awesome. If you want to work on your marriage a little bit, look at Jimmy Evans. Fantastic. Maybe we'll do a simulcast or something here in the future, but uh, great stuff. Anyhow, he talks about these five things, and I think they're fantastic. And uh, promise making. Every relationship, whether you're married or not, needs to follow these things. And if you look at uh, Genesis 2, 24 through 25, Therefore, a man shall leave. That's important. All you Italian sons. You need to leave your mom. Okay. Can I hear an amen from the ladies? Okay. Can I hear an amen from the men? You're scared. Okay. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. It says in the King James, he shall leave and cleave. We think cleave, we think cut. No. Cleave is to grab onto, become one. A man shall leave and cleave. You have to be willing to leave everyone, even your friends, even your hunting buddies, even your gossip gals, whatever you're involved with, even your friends. You got to be willing to leave it all. And priority has to go to one person first, your spouse. Period. Not the kids. Because the kids, by the way, they, they leave. And then you have nothing left if, if you don't work on that. Okay? So very important. Shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become what? One flesh. Why do you think it hurts so much when we break relationships? Because we're ripping flesh. Let me stop you for a moment for a public service announcement. Jesus forgives you if you've had a divorce. If even if you were the cause of the divorce, all of us are unrighteous, all of us. None of us are worthy of Christ. Only but what Jesus has done for us. So that little condemnation demon trying to lift, whisper in your mouth, I command it to go in Jesus' name. This is about new beginnings and healing in Jesus' name. In Je is that clear? Thank you. Now we can get back to our regular scheduled program after public service announcement is now completed. And something very interesting is that they were naked in the garden. It says they were two door together and they were naked as a jaybird. Okay? They were naked and unashamed. Now, we're not just talking about nakedness. What we're talking about is they had nothing to hide. Wouldn't it be nice to have nothing to hide? I don't have to worry about you violating me. And you don't have to worry about me violating you. There are no secrets in our relationship. Secrets are seeds of sin. You want to write that down? If you're not taking notes, write it down. Secrets are the seeds of sin. But they had nothing to hide. They didn't even know they were naked. They had great fellowship. But when they sinned, what happened? Then they felt naked. Now we have a cover-up. And it wasn't from Watergate. The first cover-up was not, Water, not Watergate. It was Fig Gate. <laughs> where they just got fig leaves and covered each other. And it wasn't just their nakedness, everybody. That, that illustrates a, a deeper point and a deeper truth. You see, God sets in motion five promises. And I'm running out of, uh, to watch out my time here. Number one, the promise of priority. The promise of priority is very, very important. Very important we have our priorities straight. Okay, this explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined with his wife, and the two are united as one. I'm going to leave father and mother. I'm going to put you first. Not second, but first. If I get invited to go someplace for my parents, I'm going to ask you first. Do I still honor my parents? Yes, but not at the expense of my spouse. You see... Just as salvation for the believer, the devil's way is to, is to help us to try to break those promises. And uh, so I am the promise of priority. And so it says in the Bible, seek first, Matthew 6, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. If you want to have a healthy marriage, seek God first. Not your spouse first, God first. And don't use that line on your spouse. Well, I'm seeking God before you. 
That's why I'm going to church and I'm never home. Mm -mm. Listen, I love church. I, I make my living doing a church. I do this for my life. But church is, church is a help. It should not be the full thing. The full thing is Jesus Christ. The Bible says, husbands, in Ephesians 5.25, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. I'm going to say something extremely controversial. If you don't like it, I'm sorry. I stand on the word of God. Men, you're the CEO of the home. Men, you're Jesus in the home. And guess what Jesus did for the church? He emptied everything and became us. He laid himself down to even die. I don't know a woman in the world that will not follow a man that's willing to die for her. Someone's got to take responsibility in the house. Men, you're it. What about the women? The women are there too. I understand that. But I, you know what? Why do you think our society is so screwed up? We're screwing up all the roles. There are roles. Equal value, different roles. Night is awesome. Day is awesome. Both have value. Why should we compete the night against the day? It's stupid. Why do we compete men against women? It's foolish. Men and women both need each other. Both have a point. Both have the same value. But there's different roles. Why do you think our society is so screwed up? Taking thousands of years and saying we don't want to believe it anymore. I, I could show you biologically. I could spend an hour with you today and talk about how this works without even opening the Bible. Why? Because it's true. I could look at science, I could look at nature, I could look at the animal kingdom and all that, and I could show you how it works. Because God's truth is God's truth. Husbands love your wives as Christ loves the church. And so, here's another promise. I promise God will be first, my first priority, and my spouse will be my second priority. The closer you get to Christ, the closer you get together. It's so important. You see, the thing that destroys marriages aren't bad things. They're the good things not prioritized in the right way. Let me read that again. Things that destroy many marriages aren't bad things. They are good things that are not prioritized correctly, Jimmy Evans says. I think it's a great quote. So all the little stuff may not be bad, but priority is extremely important. Okay, very, very important that we have that right. So here's another one. The second promise is this, the promise of pursuit. Guys, come on, let's be honest, we work hard. I, 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 a pastor told me of a friend of his, a person in his church that was kind of overweight and kind of sloppy, and his wife left him. He lost 45 pounds, got a hair transplant. <laughs> he did. And he got a, bought a brand new Corvette to get a new woman. We could get rid of the hair, tra hair transplant, but why not lose the weight for your spouse now? Why not get in better shape now? Why not look good now? It's so much better to work on the marriage you have than to go start all over again, right? So, I promise to pursue you. You know what the Bible says in Proverbs 14, 23? It says, all hard work brings profit, but mere talk leads to poverty. I love my wife. Yeah, I love her. I love my husband. Yeah, sure, I love her. Don't just talk about it. Do it. In fact, you're better off, guys and women, instead of telling your sp uh, husband, I promise you, I'm not going to bother you anymore with this, and t telling your wife, honey, I don't even promise, just do and then she'll say, or he'll say, what happened? Oh, I made a commitment to not to do that anymore. You're better off. Okay, so here's, a, here's another promise. I promise I will continue to pursue you even after I have you. I like, I read another quote. This is great. I wish I came up with this one, which I didn't. Divorcing your wife because you're out of love is like selling your car because it's out of gas. Let me read that again. That's good. Divorcing your wife because you're out of love is like selling your car because you're out of gas. The reason why you're out of gas is you haven't put gas in the tank. You have to keep the love tank full. Listen, I have to work hard at it, and if we don't do that, we're going to be in problems. I need to move forward here. <laughs> Revelation 2.5, consider how far you have fallen. This is about the church that lost its first love. Same priorities are here, okay? Consider how far you've fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. So what got you love will get you back in love. All right, this is important. We gotta move forward here. Here's, a, here's the third promise. The promise of partnership. Great marriages are one, not separate. I don't have my checking account and she has hers. No, we have one. What happens if you can't spend the money? Well, 
then we'll talk about that later on. But generally speaking, you can't, these are your kids, these are my kids. No, they're our kids, our life. Very important about that. In Matthew 19, five and six, for this reason, a man will leave, here's Jesus now, uh, again, putting an asterisk on this. A man shall leave his father and mother and be united with his wife, and the two will become, fle- fl- two will become one flesh. They're no longer two, but one flesh. And then Jesus adds another verse to it. He says this, therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Very, very important. See, the difference can, listen, let's be honest. Differences are very annoying, but they make you better. They say the opposites attract. Then they get married, and then they attack. <laughs> He's so different than me. I love him. Two years later, he's so different from me, I can't stand him. See, God wants you to be strengthened by your differences. So thank God I didn't marry myself. Sandra's completely different than me. You don't need two of me, I guarantee you right now. God wants us to be strengthened by our, our differences. In Ephesians 5.21, it says this, submit to one another out of the reverence for Christ. That's what we should do. And number four, here is another one, promise of purity. Promise of purity, what's that all about? Do you have an open and honest relationship with your wife? Women, do you have an open, honest relationship with your husband? No secrets. No secrets. Okay, it says in Ephesians 5, 8 through 12, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. Have nothing to do with the fruitless fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. Listen, you guys, you gotta be real with your wife, and and, uh, wives, you gotta be honest. I'm gonna say something that's gonna, not in my notes, so it's a little risky. Women, don't use sex as a weapon. And men, don't use it to demean your wife. Sex is not the most important thing in marriage until you're not having sex. Then it becomes the most important thing. It's it's important, it it reminds you of your marriage. It's important to cultivate that relationship. Do not neglect each other, except for a time of fasting and prayer, lest the devil tempt you. I didn't make that up, it's in those scriptures. Bending machines are, are tempting when you're not eating at home. I'm telling you the truth. Drink deeply of your love. See, you were not, it helps you a lot more. I'm gonna tell you right now, and women, don't do that to your men. And, and guys, don't just look at your wife as some kind of mechanism to get what you want. You gotta show her some love. And I know this is controversial, but get over it, because this is real life. You see, secrecy is the, is the enemy of intimacy. There has to come a point where you can just tell your wife, men, say, listen, I'm feeling a little bit, um, be able to tell your wife that. Now, we'll, we'll have another time to talk about how we handle those situations, but it's important. It's important, we have some marriage, uh, uh, by the way, we have some marriage small groups coming up. You need to sign up for them. Coleman and Cynthia are doing the one. going to be fantastic. We're going to have others as well. Look at your small groups curriculum. It's going to help you with that. And here I want to I'll give you something else. Um, I want to talk about the nuclear option. There is a nuclear option once in a while that gets to a point where it gets so bad in a marriage. Go ahead and show that slide. There has to be a nuclear option. I, I, I don't want to mention this too bad. I feel bad saying this, but there are times where you have to hit the button. And you know what the nuclear option is? Go ahead. Daily forgiveness. Nuclear. New clear. <laughs> I sound like George Bush now. Nuclear. New clear. You have to make a new clear in your relationship every day. Hit the button. I will tell you, we don't have a lot. St- Going great in many ways. I, I, I mess a lot of things up, but one thing my wife and I get right, we forgive each other daily. We don't have a little collection of stuff. Now, occasionally we'll go back and we'll say, you remember when? I remember when Jesus was on the cross. I remember that. Let's not remember that. Okay, there has to come forgiveness. That's the nuclear option, everybody. Go ahead and next slide if you could. In order for a relationship to work, let us, let's go ahead and forgive each other. And so we have the promise of priority, the promise of daily forgiveness. It says here, I'm going to conclude with this and get ready, worship team. Give us, let me show you something, daily forgiveness. In the Lord's Prayer, it says this, give us our daily bread. Next slide, please. Give us our daily bread. 
Can you go to the other slide, get rid of the picture of the nuclear warhead? <laughs> okay, that's fine. Um, we'll get it eventually. Um, thank you so much, everybody. They do a great job behind there. And there you go. Um, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our debts as we forgive our debtors. Give us today our daily bread. You know what we should do every day? The Bible talks about this. We need daily bread. What that simply means, we need food every day, do we not? And right connected to daily bread, there's a conjunction. In the English, it's and. In the Greek, it runs together as well. Daily bread and daily forgiveness. Every single day, you're going to need to be forgiven, and you're going to need to forgive somebody else. That is a daily thing. So go ahead and send it ahead. Before you leave the house, get your billfold and throw a bunch of hundreds of forgiveness currency in your wallet and be ready to forgive. I'm telling you how important it is. You know why? Because Jesus says this, forgive us our debts as we've forgiven our debtors. And then it says in Matthew 6, 15, but if you do not forgive others, their trespasses or their sins, neither will your Father forgive you. Now, I don't know how much clear, you don't need to be a Greek scholar. This is what God's saying. If you don't forgive others, I won't forgive you. What are the implications of that? I don't want to, do, do you want to play with that? I don't. Hand them over to the torturers. You will cause yourself untold sickness. Unforgiveness. You're not psychologically designed to hold on forgiveness. Even atheists, psychiatrists, and psychologists, and behavior health professionals all agree that unforgiveness is bad for your health. It lowers your immune system. It causes all kinds of trouble. And you know what it also does? It opens you up for the enemy. The enemy goes, I want to bother Eric. He hasn't forgiven his wife. He's bitter towards her. You have a right because he's opened the door. Forgive. You want to blow the enemy apart? You want to blow the enemy up? You want to nuclearize? If that's even a word? Try forgiving. You know what broke history in two? Father, forgive them. Amen. That's why history is B.C. and A.D. because of forgiveness. The whole reason Jesus came was for forgiveness. How dare you not forgive somebody else? You're hurting yourself. You're hurting society. You're hurting your children. You're hurting your friends. You're hurting the church. Remember last week with the bucket and the spoon? Compared to God, who are we? I want to end with this last verse as we get ready. I'm going to ask you to raise your hands if you've not received the elements of communion. They're going to hand them out to you. Ephesians 4, 32. Instead, be what? Kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another after they forgive you. Right? That's what it says, right? Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another after they forgive you. Nope. Instead, be kind to each other, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God, through Christ. So, this is the good news. It's almost impossible to forgive. It is. But Jesus gives us the strength to do it. You make a decision with your mind and your will, and tell your emotions to shut up. Yeah, I said shut up. Can we, can we, can we fire our emotions a little bit? The emotions, stop making the emotions your CEO. Emotions are wonderful servants, but lousy masters. Stop making your emotions your master. Christ died for us. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. Lord Jesus, we recognize today, whether we're married or not, or divorced or remarried, all of us have fallen short of your way. But Jesus, while we were yet sinners, you died for us. You forgave us of our sins. Lord, we don't have what it takes, but you do. With every head bowed and every eye closed, let me ask you a question. Have you given your life to Jesus Christ? I'm going to ask if you believe in Jesus. The devil believes in Jesus more than you. But have you surrendered your life to Jesus Christ? If you have not, today's the day. Maybe you used to walk with God and you walked away. Today's the day. Just so I better know how to pray. Can you just raise your hand real quick? Say, Pastor, I want to give my life to Christ for the very first time. 
Oh, I want to renew my commitment. Come on, just be bold this morning. Hands in the air. Anyone this morning? Okay, let's pray this prayer together. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you rose again from the dead. I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins, both known and unknown. And I choose to turn away from everything I know is wrong. And I resign from being in charge of my life. It's not my life. Lord, take it. It's yours. Now fill me with your presence and help me to walk the path. Yeah, for me today in Jesus' name. If you prayed that.